students of globalization. Welcome back and today we're going to be looking at global agriculture and modern food systems and how this is one of the biggest and most important aspects of our modern globalized system. How we are all linked together through this process that we do called eating. And I, I believe that every human being on earth, so far as I know, does this thing that we eat at least once a day and that we consume products made by other people and uh, how this all works and how this has been uh, highly detrimental in many ways to local populations um, to, to local environments um, and uh, and how modern agriculture has developed and developed within our modern food systems and, and shaped our modern food systems is, is very important over the course of the last century um, and it, it, uh, it shows a, a great level of interconnectivity of the world uh, and uh, for for good or bad, um, how that has affected affected our societies and our natural environments and us as human beings. How has this all changed us? This We're going to look at these topics within this lecture. So how has globalization affected farming? So long, long ago, actually not that long ago, a hundred years ago, farming was done by a very large amount of human beings um, and it was done through the use of domesticated animals that would it would assist in tilling the soil and uh, crops would be planted by hand and it required an enormous amount of effort um, before the year 1900 no let's say 1850 before the year 1850 90% of the world's population is going to be directly involved in farming. Uh, the vast, vast majority of, of uh, human beings are going to be uh, reliant upon or directly involved within the agricultural sector because so much time and effort was put into pro the production of foods to keep populations thriving and alive. Um, this changed radically uh, at the end of the industrial period with the invention of the internal combustion engine. So agriculture goes from a guy and his horse or a team of horses plowing fields, uh, uh, mowing, mowing crops, uh, harvesting crops uh, by, by hand with sickles um, to uh, machine driven agriculture where the use of, of tractors allows for one human being um, to to farm, plant, till, do all the processes of agriculture uh, uh, in a much, much more efficient fashion. And you can see here um, within this chart human population growth over the course of the last millennium. And human populations have remained fairly stagnant except for uh, the odd uh, plague here or there, uh, but the, they haven't largely increased until you see the advent of modern agriculture and antibiotics. So we're, we'll look at this, um, but uh, global farming has, has allowed a human population to develop in massive numbers uh, in ways that just simply the past has had never done. So the, the, the advent of new technologies um, has allowed a human population to grow exponentially and we have changed our model it's not as if everybody has their own little farm and is, is uh, raising uh, organic uh, crops uh, that are in, in uh, many many different crops but it has been on a cash crop model um, that there are several crops that uh, have been produced in very large numbers namely uh, wheat soybeans corn uh, or maize and then the uh, uh, through husbandry, uh, cattle, hogs, and chickens uh, have been the staples that are being adopted throughout the whole world. And this is a very Western-centric model that, uh, from the time of the Columbian Exchange, uh, we have uh, we saw the introduction of these core species and, and these, uh, these, these agricultural crops that have sustained human life and, and uh, that, that can be sold and marketed um, rather than just simply consumed at a local level. 
And so this has been this has been the trend over the past 50, 70 years uh, to the adoption of all cash crop uh, style farming, which has caused uh, deforestation, has caused uh, uh, native crops to be uh, to be uh, extinct or or, uh, or vastly reduced. Um, but uh, this this model was adopted because of the massive increase in human populations, uh, and uh, and and. Uh, in order to be able to produce this amount of, of food for this growing population uh, because of the advent of, of antibiotics uh, and, and uh, other technologies that allows human populations to grow unchecked, um, this, this supply of food has to in some way come to meet the demand. So scientists and, and farmers have, have, uh, have answered the call of large populations. And I've been referring to antibiotics. And here we see Alexander Fleming who is a British science, Scottish scientist, uh, and uh, he discovers penicillin kind of accidentally in, uh, in 1928. And Fleming, in his discovery, allows the human population to go, if you look back at this chart, to go from uh, you know, a, a gradually increasing number to just an explosion of population. Uh, so I think really we can look at, at uh, the discovery of antibiotics as key to just basically allowing unchecked and exponential human population growth because now simple infections uh, do not lead to large-scale deaths. Uh, plagues um, are able to be treated in ways that they were not before. So this allows for uh, a very a very new way of doing medicine, of, uh, of allowing uh, human beings to live and thrive and not fear diseases uh, or tooth abscesses that would have killed you uh, before the advent of antibiotics that just simply uh, the world is, is going to to uh, have much longer lifespans and people are going to live which is I think a good thing but it it is uh, it has been has had uh, um, um, negative effects on the environment because of the vast large percentage of the human population and the amount of foods uh, that we are growing and the amount of land that we need in order to grow this amount of food for this vast human population. So within agriculture itself, uh, we'll look uh, specifically here at America for just a moment, but um, with, with the advent of the internal combustion engine and the use of tractors and, and, and uh, combines and, and things like this, uh, these mechanical reapers, and, and there's a whole uh, litany of, of inventions that, that lead us basically to the tractor and its, uh, the, the uh, mechanical tractor. And this invention and its manifestations allowed for a f small, very small number of human beings to feed a very large population. No longer was 80, 90 percent of the population needing to be involved in agriculture. So this allows for people to turn to other things and move into urban environments, pursue different jobs within industry, uh, and, and uh, just simply move into other, other fields of work because not everybody needed or could be involved in agriculture with the use of these, uh, with, within uh, modernized agriculture, with the mechanical agriculture. So we see uh, with the advent of the use of the tractor and, and uh, these massive plows that allows uh, previously uncultivatable land to be to be used, such as the Great Plains uh, th throughout the, the the American West, um, we see the exhaustion of, of lands uh, by the 1930s, and um, and farmers that had to go enormously into debt because they were producing so much food that their crops were becoming worthless. There was so much supply and there was not enough demand in order to to meet their needs. So they got into trouble, they borrowed a lot of money, uh, and uh, that's right at the time when the Great Depression happened. So the bottom fell out of the market, uh, people were out of work, they lost their farms, uh, and then of course they have exhausted the land. So their crops are not going to come in for whatever little amount of money that they could have sold them for. Um, it just simply didn't work. So this, this uh, created the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, decided after this, this point um, that they would pay people to stop growing crops. That's right. They would pay people 
to grow less stuff in order to artificially keep agricultural prices high and you could keep people working on their farms and producing producing agricultural goods but you could you would not produce as much as before so it would not cause uh, these massive amounts of bankruptcies and also within that the, the soil conservation department is uh, is comes out of the the great depression dust bowl era uh, and uh, and by paying people to stop growing things and to turn some of their land back over into to a more natural environment this prevents erosion on the scale um, that uh, happened during the Dust Bowl, where you have these massive, massive dust storms that, that are, are basically like sandstorms in the Sahara Desert. Uh, this is an attempt to, to, uh, to help agriculture by paying them not to do things. So, shortly after the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl comes World War II. And within the period of the World Wars, uh, there is an enormous amount of, of uh, new chemical processes that are discovered in order to make poisons. Uh, poison gas within World War I and then uh, other artificial uh, uh, chemicals, substances that were used within World War II. And after this, the same companies that had developed these weapons of war needed an, a, an outlet. So they were able to create seeds and plants that were able, you could spray poison on them um, and that they would live, but the poison would then kill everything else. These are companies like Monsanto uh, and, and others. But uh, through the, the use of pesticides, which kill bugs but don't kill the plants, and the use of herbicides, which course kill the weeds but not the the corn or the soybeans or whatever crop that they are designed or that have been genetically uh, designed in order to be resistant to the the poisons that you spray on these these uh, these crops uh, glycinfates um, there there is able to be an entirely new model of farming that requires massive amounts of of the use of these pesticides um, and, and herbicides that you have to then spray your crops with poison in order to keep them healthy and, and thriving. And you can see here this cornfield, uh, which is so dense, uh, you would, in a, a, if you go out in your garden and you decide you're going to plant a crop of corn, you could never ever plant corn this thickly. You could plant anything this, this thick um, because it just simply will never mature to a level that will produce any kind of a good crop unless you interject an enormous amount of synthetic fertilizer. Now our predecessors, uh, farmers who came in the 1800s, had one option to use for fertilizer, and that is animal manure, uh, or compost that they made. And synthetic nitrogen fertilizers allow for you to plant crops so tightly and grow so much of it uh, because you can interject artificially this this uh, massive amount of nutrient that allows these crops to grow and develop uh, and you can harvest them and they produce great uh, amounts of of, uh, of of grains now this is very good in a sense that you have to feed a massive world population but it's bad in that it is it uh, is just simply not a natural process and it's quite harmful um, to the environment around it and uh, it has been suggested that some of these chemicals uh, have been uh, toxic to the human beings to animals uh, to the the creation of these monocultures across the united states across europe uh, across the the whole world uh, have have been uh, just deadly to uh, to bees and populations of, of pollinators and, and things like this. So it, it, uh, it's, it's good in the sense that you have to feed a world population and this is one way to do it. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's quite detrimental to natural holistic environments. So what do you do um, with this enormous amount of the ability to be able to produce uh, this all this food? Well, obviously human beings are not going to be able to consume this massive, massive amount of uh, genetically designed food that is, is able, farmers are able to produce vastly more food 
than is, is needed for the human population, which is why the government was subsidizing them to not produce food uh, in the United States. So after, after World War II, there really begins this, this sort of massive production of, of foodstuffs at very cheap cost that uh, uh, they, they felt uh, the scientists at the USDA, Department of Agriculture, found that you needed a lot of protein, or it was suggested uh, with intense lobbying that you needed a lot of protein in your diet. So how do you get protein? Well, you, of course, eat animals. So you have to make f uh, meat cheap. So we see the, the growth at, the, at this time in the 1970s, uh, really, is, is uh, being the, the introduction of these massive feed lots. Now, if you look at this photo here, you can see the, the animals. This is not, of course, the natural environment of grazing herbivores. And in herbivores, by definition, graze freely on grasslands, and uh, they are beneficial to grasslands, and they don't eat large amounts of grains, right? They eat grass. They might eat some grains as they come upon them, um, but uh, that is not the primary staple of their diet, and this is how massive industrial feedlots um, uh, feed their animals, because if by eating massive amounts of grains, the animals mature faster. So if you want a cheap product, and you need to take all this corn and, and soybeans that you are producing in these massive cornfields across Iowa and the Great Plains everywhere, um, then you feed it mostly to animals that then people eat. And you see how this whole process is interconnected. And this uh, becomes really part of the Western diet where meat um, is going to be the chief component of, these, of, these, uh, of the diet of, of, uh, the, of the Western nations. Also in the 1950s, um, you began to see the growth explosion of the, the sort of the fast food market. And um, what this was was an attempt to put the factory model into a restaurant. You know, no more are you going to have a chef that is going to sit and prepare a, a nice meal and you'll sit down, but rather this is a... a assembly line of people who are going to put a hamburger together as fast as they can, throw in some french fries, put it in a bag, give it to you, and let you get out as fast as you possibly can. And them to make the food as quickly as possible. The McDonald's brothers, for instance, uh, were, uh, were chief uh, innovators within this type of a food model. Now this is not to say that it is good or it is bad, but this is just how the, the, uh, the food systems within the United States developed. Um, and as these restaurants could produce very cheap food very quickly, uh, people began to consume this. So hum uh, the, uh, the people of the United States liked this. They chose to be a part of this model. It was marketed well to them. There, of course, you have the advent of television and commercials and things like that. Um, and, and then you have also... The TV dinner. I just, I just love these things. Um, you can sit down, you can watch TV, um, because the traditional model of the household where mom stays home and makes food for the whole family, dad goes away to work, um, this, this is beginning to end in the 1960s, late 50s, 60s, certainly in the 70s. Um, women are going to work, and they don't want to have to come home and, and, uh, and make dinner. Uh, rather, you can just simply take these TV dinners, these, these wonderful looking things here, and you can pop them in the oven really quickly, or even the microwave, this new technology that allows you to have food very, very quickly. Um, and um, you can feed your whole family very easily, very cheap, uh, and, uh, and, and you don't have to go and burden yourself with actually cooking it. You just throw it in, here you go. Um, and so this is, this is sort of how the development of new food systems um, is 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 done in the United States, and it and and these companies, of course, are working hand in hand with the meat producers that are have have, uh, have stakes in this and and uh, pardon the pun there, um, but uh, these these new forms of food are are predicated on large amounts of meat. 
So we see massive amounts of meat, very small amounts of, of vegetables, and highly processed foods that go into into these TV dinners, these these pre-prepared foods, these uh, um, processed foods, as, as we like to call them, and also within the the um, fast food industry. Why? Because vegetables spoil easily. You can It's much easier to preserve other things, and we see the use of preservatives within food, etc. So remember I said in after the uh, Dust Bowl and Great Depression, the United States government began to subsidize farmers, and not just in the United States, but all over the world. They began to subsidize farmers to not grow stuff because there's just simply, they, they sim just have too much, uh, they have too great of an ability to produce so much food um, that you cannot, uh, you can't stay in farm, you will not make any money because the, su the supply will so far exceed the demand, you just simply can't sell it all. So there's a, a complete reverse course in 1977. Earl Butts, who is the Secretary of agriculture at the time says this is just simply a foolish policy to to pay people to not grow things and instead they're going to grow uh, things in in uh, in much larger quantities they're going to subsidize people to grow as much as possible so we see a massive interjection of uh, of capital into new processes so now farmers instead of of uh, letting some ground re uh, remain fallow uh are encouraged to till every single inch of their land and produce as much as possible because the government is going to pay you for every every bushel of soybeans or corn that you grow um, you're going to be subsidized for and this is the only way that farming could be made profitable is if it is subsidized within this massive monoculture model where you have just a few crops that everybody is producing and what are they going to do uh, with this stuff? Well, you're going to feed more animals. You've got to encourage people to eat more foods. You've got to, uh, and if you're going to feed all these animals, then you've got to design things like your national school lunches in order to have incredible amounts of protein uh, within them. So that way you can, uh, you can force or encourage, rather, I should say, oops, um, the... Uh, your your systems your your uh, regulatory systems to to how to use this this material this 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 uh this meat and protein products such as dairy and and, and whatnot um to be fed to your populations in large quantities so as i was saying earlier all this process, all this this uh, this increased production of of foodstuffs of of, uh, of row crop, corn, soybeans, milo, wheat, um, encourages the creation of more and more large feedlots, and again, these animals are fed this grain, and no creature can live in an environment like a feedlot without the use of systemic antibiotics because they will get sick. Um, in many cases, the uh, the animal is forced to, in almost all cases, animals are forced to stand in their own feces, that they are live in extreme close proximity to each other. Um, they, will, they will get very sick and it will spread rapidly through the entire herd. Um, so therefore, you have to treat the grain that they are eating every day with systemic antibiotics. Antibiotics. Antibiotics used uh, on on animals are in in and of themselves not bad in order to help a creature get over an illness, but when it's used systemically, it causes the development of resistance uh, to antibiotics and and uh, and has the the uh, the int or it has the ability to create antibiotic resistant uh, super uh, bugs. Um, so this is this is a, certainly an issue that is worth considering, and this type of agriculture is is still done in the United States and throughout the world. Um, and we have to ask ourselves some questions about whether uh, whether this is good and how we wish to continue to see our industries develop. Um, and should we be doing it uh, agriculture this way? So 
is this animal abuse? If you observe one of these feedlots and how the creatures are treated there, uh, I think that's one question that we have to ask ourselves. Is this, is this okay in order to treat uh, living creatures in this fashion? Now, I'm not uh, suggesting we all become uh, vegans, um, but at the same time, is there a way to produce uh, enough food that uh, we don't have to, to um, treat animals in, in, such, in such, a, such ways and, and have them live in such conditions? The environmental costs uh, within these massive uh, feedlot productions, uh, in Dodge City, for instance, there's a 75,000 head uh, feedlot, Dodge City, Kansas. Uh, the amount of waste that is generated from this, uh, meaning animal uh, manure, urinating, um, it has to go somewhere, and it very often goes into watersheds and is, is highly toxic. Um, to the environments uh, surrounding these feedlots, not to mention the the uh, smell and pollutions that uh, come from from where these these uh, these places are. Now, if we're going to want to continue to eat meat at the level that we are, at the same price that we are currently enjoying, um, then these operations are necessary, and they are doing the job that we have asked them to do. Um, but is that good? Is that something we want to continue doing? These are some questions we have to ask. And are human being, should human beings be consuming these products at uh, these, these uh, products or animal or having to be treated with systemic antibiotics and, and given steroids and these kinds of things in order to make them get as big as they can, as fast as they can? Is that good for human beings? Is it good for human beings that have to live around these, uh, these massive agricultural production centers? Um, is it good for the people who have to work in these environments? Again, all questions we need to be asking ourselves about our globalization model and our globalized food systems. So if we look here uh, with just the amount of water usage um, for, for one hamburger, uh, so requires 3,000 gallons of water. So if you eat one hamburger within our current model for beef production, um, it's going to be equivalent to taking a shower every night for two months. So the husbandry industry within the United States uses about a third of all the water in the, uh, within the United States. So, and this, this model will hold very similar for, for the rest of the world. So uh, the consumption of water now within these, these industries is enormous. Um, so we need to be thinking about that, about, uh, and especially if we're you know, raising a lot of livestock in areas that are starved uh, for water, Southern California, for instance, uh, or the, uh, the Southwest. You know, how, are we, uh, how can we justify the continued, uh, the continued agricultural models that we are uh, when we are, are, are depleting uh, water supplies? There is no delta within the Colorado River. The depletion of the Aliagua Aquifer in, in uh, the western United States, uh, all over. You know, we have to. We just have to consider these models and what can we do about it. And I've given you some some other uh, issues here with livestock uh, raising. Now, I, I am. I just want to say openly that I am not against uh, raising of livestock, and, and uh, um, I am not against farming. Um, but I just want to take it into consideration for a moment the costs that come from our current models and could we be doing this a little bit better so when you say uh, I'm an environmentalist and I want to see greenhouse gases go down we have to ask ourselves um, what is causing this now most people would point to the burning of fossil fuels and our driving and, and, and things like that so if you add up all the the costs of, of uh, or the, the amount of emissions that come from, from all automobiles, planes, and ships in the world, uh, it comes to about 13% of our greenhouse gases. Livestock alone comes to 18% of, of our, our greenhouse emissions. So that's an enormous amount, uh, estimated amount, of, of greenhouse gases that come from these massive, uh, uh, massive amount of animals that we have 
we have grown in order to consume them. And the, the grazing of cattle, for instance, has uh, caused a massive amount of deforestation in the world because we have asked farmers in regions of the world where they're in the tropics, such as in Brazil, um, we've asked them to produce these, these cash crops like cattle because we want to consume them in large numbers all over the world. Um, so it has generated more than a, a 136 million acres annually of deforestation by clearing land so that way you can graze, uh, graze livestock on these, on these areas. Uh, and uh, just for comparison's sake, uh, palm oil, which has been sort of the great, uh, the great evil of, of uh, the killing of tropical rainforests, especially in Indonesia and, and, and throughout Asia, um, has only amounted to the loss of 26 million acres. So anyway, we can just we can say that the if we want to continue eating meat at the amounts that we are eating it and paying the same prices, there's going to be some severe environmental costs. Are we willing to pay these environmental costs? Um, should we be paying these environmental costs? Um, should our global food systems be altered in order to to preserve the environment while helping farmers or encouraging farmers uh, to, to grow and do other things? These are questions we have to ask. So if we look here in the United States, um, we see that there is massive amounts of pollution that comes from massive agricultural production systems that we have designed and farmers are doing exactly what we have asked them to do through our national and globalized food systems and policies. This is not to demonize a farmer, um, but simply to show that our current practices that we have enshrined within policy uh, and uh, we are asking them to produce these products that we are consuming, they are doing it and therefore we have created dead zones. And if you look all over the world, there are dead zones in the massive river deltas, the Amazon River Delta, uh, the, the Congo River Delta, the Mississippi River Delta down in, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, for instance, here you can see that there's a massive dead zone because of all the, the pollution that comes from the runoff of the, using these synthetic herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, animal waste, waste that comes from our cities, um, and it has created a ocean desert that uh, nothing can live in this that was a previously thriving and bucolic uh, area for, for much, much life and fishing in, in the uh, Mississippi River Delta. So again, another environmental cost. And here you can see uh, the amount of deforestation that has taken place um, because of the production of cash crops and, and animal husbandry and uh, as, it has, uh, as it relates to that. So we are seeing uh, much deforestation and uh, another important thing is the desertification of lands because of overgrazing. Uh, especially we see this in uh, sub-Saharan Africa that uh, every year uh, there's just a little bit more land that is destroyed on account of agricultural use. Uh, so there are ways to do this better and there are people who are working to, do, to design better models so that we can preserve our environment that helps preserve uh, human populations uh, all over the world that uh, we can do agriculture uh, in a better way. But it has to be adopted within sort of a global matrix and a global model and it's not something that will happen overnight but it requires massive and systemic changes. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the, the human cost um, to all of these, these, uh, these policies that we have put in place in the United States? So I'm just going to confine this to one issue in the United States, and this is, uh, this is not to say this is the only issue, um, but it is certainly a major issue and one that we see growing everywhere that is adopted Western diets, that we uh, eat large amounts of meat and dairy, uh, and uh, in, in massive numbers, and we consume large amounts of sugar. And this is not even something I've raised, but the sugar production is also uh, a part of this. So we see uh, Americans since 1970 have gotten uh, quite heavy, quite obese. And uh, we see this beginning at the time when we start to subsidize agriculture and we change our models everywhere to large amounts of protein consumption, uh, and we, we have to put this food that we produce 
somewhere. And that is in human beings. First, we put, we put this food in animals, and then human beings consume these animals. And we see the transformation of our lifestyles, that we once were a large nation of farmers who worked manually and, and were manual laborers. Now we are the vast majority of us sitting behind computers uh, in fairly uh, uh, docile uh, environments. So you see the introduction of much calorically dense food uh, at the, and at the same time um, a, a lack of, of, uh, of exercise. Uh, this all has led to kind of an obesity crisis. So as we, we, uh, we, we have this new industrialized food and we eat a lot of processed food and we are living sedimentary lives, um, the farmer, the agricultural systems, the food systems that have grown out of uh, the the uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s, they are are producing a lot of of industrialized, mass-produced food that needs to needs to have very long shelf lives. That you can buy something that will last six months and put it on your shelf, and you can open it up, eat it, eat it very quickly, uh, and it's usually very uh, very salty, very uh, calorically dense. Um, but this is how our food systems have been designed, and it's the same all over the world that the Western uh, massive uh, corporate model has uh, of food systems has been put into place everywhere, and um, and this is what people are eating, and they are eating very high calorically dense foods um, that are mass produced. Um, and they are eating lots of protein all over the world, uh, more and more protein, which is causing the, the environmental destruction uh, of the world. So we are, we are in the process of rethinking how maybe we can do this because it's not probably the best uh, how we've designed our systems and policies for our environments or perhaps for us as well. So we will... Be looking at some of, of uh, Michael Pollan's in, in Vice, uh, and uh, I think really he's a, he's a great food uh, critic and, and an examiner of, of food systems and uh, how how we go about agriculture and the production of food. Um, and really, he has the, the summation of, of, of wisdom here is in his in his book uh, De in defense of food. He simply says, "Eat food, not too much, mostly plants." And uh, through these things, I think we can we can individually, because a big part of this globalization process and studying globalism is how we become good citizens within uh, within this this uh, global society of ours. And I think we can choose to do that every day. That we can choose to to what we eat every day and what we consume is a big big part of how the world is is cared for. And uh, that this is not to say everybody has to become a vegan um, and everybody has to become an environmental activist. Um, but simply by making some intelligent, informed decisions and understanding how uh, big agriculture works and, and the processes, uh, the, the policies that we, the, uh, the governments, the people of, of uh, the nations of the world put into place, um, by choosing what we eat very carefully, we can we can alter how how farmers how policies are designed because this is our vote you get to vote three times a day so uh, we can choose to eat industrialized food or we can choose not to um, we can choose to eat meat or we can choose not to we can choose what we eat where we eat it from and how it was processed and uh, so a big part of this is that you can be a very good steward of, of global uh, globalization and global citizen and you can practice good global citizenship so i thank you for watching and uh, i encourage you to explore and think about these uh these macro uh, agricultural processes and all that goes into what you are eating on a daily basis so until next time i encourage you to stay healthy